Uh, I do want to thank our pastor for giving us this space and allowing me to share with you. Uh, and I am aware uh, that blessed are the short-winded, for they get to speak again. So I won't, I won't be before you too long, but I do think that it is, uh, we do need to take a second and take some time to really think about and enjoy uh, the reason that we are here. Uh, the message today uh, that we'll be looking at is the importance of Father's Day. Um, and before we move any further, uh, let me pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I pray right now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord. Use me as a conduit to say what you need to say. Open our hearts to your words and your love, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit rule and govern everything that goes forward from here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, I want to start by saying that um, he is right. I am an English teacher and I have an English background. And so, oh, I forgot. I got to get direction from the wife. Uh, one thing you learn uh, in the capacity as a father, you also learn how to be a good husband if you get in the right situation. So, I'm learning and uh, being a student of that as well. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is going to be a little bit unorthodox in the fact that uh, for me, I am, again, a classroom teacher. And so when I think about uh, exhortation, and specifically the message today is dedicated to fathers. So you guys get to kind of ear hustle and listen in on what it is that we're going to do. So I'm going to take a little risk here, and, and Pastor uh, gave me permission before uh, hand. So I wanted to do this. And uh, again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. Um, no matter how long you have been in that position, you are in a very important, impactful, and valued position, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. But um, this is gonna require some audience participation. So if you had planned to sit back and take you a nice nap. I'm gonna interrupt it just for a little bit, uh, just so we can kind of have some interaction. Again, today uh, is about fathers, and this is dedicated to them, so I did want to use this platform in a manner. Um, so we're gonna be a little bit unscripted. What I'm gonna ask you to do is, here in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna present a series of questions when you come up with an answer to that question, I want you to come up here and I'm gonna give you specific instructions. So I encourage you to be bold. Everyone will have an opportunity to share and you'll see hopefully the method to my madness behind this. If it works, thank God. If it fails, you can thank me. So uh, next slide, please. So, um, in a historical sense, going back to where did Father's Day come from? How did we arrive at this moment? Um, it's a fairly new construction in our society. As you can see here, it wasn't until 1972 that it became an American national holiday. So prior to 1972, um, Mother's Day was already actually being celebrated. And as a matter of fact, the story goes that in um, way back in 1909, a young lady uh, by the name of Sonora Dodd decided while she was in church listening to a message on Mother's Day that, hey, you know what, this this same idea, this celebration of motherhood and the role that they play in everyone's lives, everyone has a mother, everyone also has a father. So she thought, in the middle of service, we need to do something to celebrate fathers. Now, you also have to understand what her personal condition was. Her father, uh, her mother was deceased, and her father, a Civil War veteran, raised he, her and her five siblings by himself. And so she looked at that and she said, you know what? We 
need to do the same thing for our fathers that we've been doing with our mothers. Fast forward, 1972, 58 years after Woodrow Wilson had declared Mother's Day a national holiday, we finally get Father's Day. Now, based on that, next slide. I want you to answer this question. Where do you think Father's Day ranks as an American holiday? All right, come on now. Okay. So, answer choice A, it is ranked number four, um, followed, uh, following after the winter holidays, which is Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's, right? Answer choice B, it's ranked number seven among American holidays after Easter and Valentine's, back to school, college, and all of the winter holidays. Okay. Answer choice C, it is ranked 10th among American holidays after Labor Day and Halloween. Or finally, answer choice D, it is ranked number one among American holidays. After all, we are celebrating Father's Day today. What is the answer to that question? Come on down. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. How many people, wait, wait, don't move, don't move. How many people believe it's C? You, come on back, come on back. How many people believe it's C by a show of hands? All right. Okay, good guess, good guess. Now, uh, this is talking about where fathers rank. I do want to put you on the spot for just a second and give you an opportunity. What, what led you to see and what is your direct interaction as a father or the impact that your father has had on you to lead you to think it was C? Um, what led me to believe it was C uh, is because I just know that it's not as celebrated as the other holidays. Um, also, uh, you know, research. And um, as far as my father, my father had a great impact on my life. Um, that it had nothing to do with the question. As far as my father, he had a, he, you know, he taught me a lot of like work ethic and responsibility and leadership and doing stuff when it's not easy, things like that. So. But uh, so it had no impact on that. My answer is just my impact as far as I mean, my perception as far as like the way it's promoted, the way um, everybody has uh, everyone is apathetic towards it. Um, just just society in general. I mean, I've been kind of complaining about it all week. My wife knows like we just not fathers are not just celebrated. You know, so thank you. Thank you. Good answer. All right, all right. Um, any other guesses? I, I saw a large majority of the people said that it was C that they were going with. Any other? Yes. Okay, and, and in case you couldn't hear that, she said answer choice D, uh, based on her own experience with her father, uh, that, of course, he is going to be number one, and that is something that she personally celebrates. But again, the question revolves around the American concept. What do we as a country, how do we view this holiday? And a majority of you went with C, and a majority of you would be absolutely wrong. <laughs> the correct answer is, in fact, answer choice B. Number, answer choice A is actually for Mother's Day. That is the statistic. So when you look at it, mothers are only celebrated behind our favorite winter holidays. Fathers fall all the way to number seven. We are behind back to school, back to college celebrations. And of course, the winter holidays would fall there. But 
Number seven for fathers. Number four for mothers. Next slide, please. So what is going on? What's happening? What I have for you there, and that might look really familiar to you, these are the representations of American dads. And so as time has gone on, you can see the progression of what we view as the American version of dad or father. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna ask you a question. Uh, we're gonna start here with this first one. What is the person's role? What's their name and the show, okay? So I want you to predict or let me know who is this and what show, what role did they play in the show? So let's start and you can choose anyone because I know some are easier than others. Come on down, all right? Now, when you share your answer with us, you are going to do a little comparison. How is your experience with your father or your experience being a father related to that character that you choose? Um, I grew up watching Good Times with my mom, so 1974, that is James Evans. Um, his role was the hardworking dad and the really bad, like, racist, you know, error, yeah. and um, what else? And poverty. Um, so black people, we had, we know, you know, it was a struggle back then. And so he was a great representation of basically what everything, everyone was going through in his ethnicity. And um, how it relates to me, um, that's basically my dad. Um, <laughs> We didn't really have to face poverty as hard as they did, um, but yeah, it's basically him. Very hardworking guy, very upstanding guy, um, put his family first. Um, yeah, making sure his family had food on the table. All right, so we get James Evans. James Evans is now off the board, all right? We've got four other fathers and figures there. Give me one, I need, I need another. Come on down. Okay. Father Knows Best. Beautiful. And he was the ideal father. His kids came to him, they got advice. He told them how to be good citizens, good people, and it was just a role where Father knew best. <laughs> Beautiful. We got two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got three other representatives here. Anyone? Somebody make my way up. All right. Come on <laughs> All right. up. Pastor. All right. I'm looking at the man in the middle. Um, his name is Bill Cosby. Um, we won't talk about his personal life. We'll talk about his role as uh his him on himself on the show and so uh he was uh a, a quintessential example of, of black excellence um they were uh, a well-to-do family they were uh, make they made a lot of money and they, they had a real nice house they were there in the lives of their kids and all of their interactions and they were very present they were not only were they um, professionals and, and made a lot of money but they were also present in the lives of their children and so um it was the ideal family for people to look up to. And so the, uh, the Huxtable family uh, is somebody that even to this day is revered within African-American culture and, and, and people often, uh, well, prior to his uh, moral fallings in real life, looked up to the Huxtable family as someone to aspire to be as an African-American. Um, I, I think about my own upbringing and uh, while we weren't as well off as the Huxtables, um, I could relate to uh, my parents having um, the resources to not only help us, but help those that were in our family, in our community, and those that were around. I can relate to them being involved in our lives, even though they had their own responsibilities and their own jobs that they had to worry about. And um, it was uh, the warm feeling of home that, that, that the, the Huxtable family had, I feel like I can relate to because I grew up in a household where I felt my parents were involved and, and cared. Thank you. 
echoing those sentiments, and we're gonna come back to Mr. Cosby here in a little bit, but um, I do think it is of note that at the zenith of their popularity, he appeared on the cover of People Magazine and the title was America's Dad. It did not say America's Black Dad. It did not say America's Wealthy Dad or Comedic Dad. It said America's Dad. So um, as we're going, I'm, I'm cooking y'all, I promise. But I want you to recognize how the line is changing. Look at how the role goes, all right? Um, I'm gonna pick on my own daughter because I can do that. Come on, Maddie, come on up here. All right, you get either 99 or 2014. You tell me which one. 99. All right, who is that? Peter Griffin, Family Guy. From Family Guy, what do we know about Peter Griffin? He's a funny dad. He tries to help as much as he can with his kids, and he tries his best to help them. Thank you, good, good, good. All right. Last one, last one. Got one more. I'm gonna pick on Melanie. Come on, Mel. You don't know who that is? Okay. Stan. Yes, yeah, all right. So I'll take the last one. This last one, and I want you to look at the title of the series. It's titled American Dad. And the lead character, Stan, is that gentleman in the middle, and, and of course, as you can see, he has this loving family around him. Um, but I thought it was significant to put a timeline there. Remember, when did I say that Father's Day became a national holiday? 72. So in 54, we already had this conception of what the perfect father and family looked like. Central to the role, we even stated it in the title, Father Knows Best. Here is his role, and you saw his interaction, as my mother pointed out, how he conducted life and interacted intentionally in the lives of his family. Then we get to James Evans. He's the first representation of the black family while it is rooted in struggle, he still takes on the role and takes on a very prominent role on weathering the family through the storm. Now, I do want to note and put an asterisk there because something in particular happened in that show. In the midst of what was going on, James Evans gets taken out. And then what started to happen? You got a completely different series that became mother-centric as opposed to father-centric. In comes Mr. Cosby to the rescue. And for the first time, people of color saw themselves in a place that was not regularly highlighted, specifically the father who not only contributed to the lives of his children, but also embedded himself in the community as a doctor. So he was giving help in his role, not just in his family and establishing that, but he also established communal ethics. So America's dad, regardless of color, began to look at his role and say, that is what defines fatherhood. He even wrote a book about it. But then something else started to happen. We get Peter Griffith. And I think it's appropriate that they are cartoons. They're animated. They're not real. They are caricatures, and a caricature is an exaggeration. It's something that's designed to kind of poke fun at. Peter Griffith accidentally, through all of his shows, accidentally arrives at the right answer. And most of the time, he even teaches his children to do wrong. But they get the right result at the end because this is comedy. 
Then we took it a little bit further in American Dad, who is totally inept in fatherhood. He is a poor representation if you are using that as a model to model or pattern yourself after if you want to be a representation of a dad. But what started to happen over the years? That role, how do we roll? That role started to change. Next slide, please. So you have to know your role as a father. And more specifically, I'm gonna parse a little bit here. As he said, I am an English major, so I like words. Words have meaning. God said, and that's how we showed up. So there is power in speech. But first of all, we've got to understand the difference between a father and a daddy. Father's Day is the acknowledgement of this. A father is defined according, according to Miriam Webster as either A, a male parent, or B, a man who has begotten a child. So guess what? On Father's Day, not only are we acknowledging fathers, but we also get a chance to acknowledge daddies. Because here's the thing, there are people in this world that have a father, but they ain't got a daddy. What is that difference? Well, daddy is a term of respect and obedience that conveys a deep sense of trust and also dependence. So it's not just, I can look to this daddy for support, I can look to this daddy for protection. I can look to this daddy for provision, but I also have a deep respect and love and trust that whatever he leads me to do, I can follow. I'll be okay. So unfortunately, what happened is as we move through time, especially here in America, we went from looking at daddies on TV to showing fathers. These are just males who created a child. Now, appropriately, it's Father's Day, and I, I, I don't want you to lose hope if you were one of those who had a father and not a daddy. Because in order to be a daddy, that requires relationship going somewhere when you are a father it is bare minimum the only requisite is that you got to be one a man and to create a child minimum congratulations you're a father however when we talk about fatherhood and what does it mean to be a daddy? We're having a completely different conversation because now we're talking about relationship. Next slide, please. So here is the good news. Here is the great part of what's going on. We got a blueprint on how do we become a daddy and enjoy fatherhood as opposed to just showing up and being a father. So, fatherhood is this. God is the progenitor of all. Everybody say all. all. That means everything. The word progenitor comes from, in Latin, it comes from genitor, right? Which means to parent, to father, to sire, to create. So, when we say God is the author and finisher. He is the progenitor. That means he is the creative force that created us, the created, the progeny. Progeny just means offspring or child. If you don't have 
an earthly father, it's okay. You can still enjoy and celebrate on Father's Day. Why? Because God is the father of all. So whether your daddy was present or not, your father in heaven takes on that role. And guess what? If I can't create that relationship with my earthly father, Father's Day is good enough to where I can create that relationship with heavenly father. And now he's daddy. So don't get caught up. This is why when the Bible says honor your father, you're honor that he much God gave us that creative power. He put it into men, right? He said, you're going to be just like me. So you'll be able to reproduce. So that is divine because we can't do it on our own. So when we get to Father's Day and you're looking at, well, I don't have a reason I had an absent father, and those are valid feelings, but it's not right. We got to learn to pay attention to the difference between what I feel and what is real, what is right. So, yes, you have the right to get in your feelings. God created that emotion. But guess what? You're going to be celebrating Father's Day. You have to honor the divine. He's the progenitor and we are the creators. So you've got to honor that space. Why? Well, here's the difference. What does God command fathers to do specifically? So now I'm getting I'm talking to daddies. We about to get into it. So relationship. He says you in Deuteronomy and I highlighted the important words. Your job as a father is to impress the words that God has given to us. Write them on your heart and you shall teach them to your sons. Talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down, and when you rise up. So your job as a father, if you're doing it correctly and you want to get into the daddy space, if we're doing our job correctly, then guess what? We're modeling for our family what God has done for us. Your job, your literal job is to walk around and be God on earth so you can show and model to your children, to your family, exactly what he did. And as a matter of fact, you got to get in your Bible and you got to know and learn and put it on your heart. In order for it to be on your heart, that means I don't have to check. It's there. I've been around it so much, people say, you memorize something by heart, right? I know this by heart. That means you have to spend so much time in God's word that it becomes second nature. And you can't just do it in private. You got to do it out loud. You have to do it so your children can see. Because the only way that that's going to get transmitted, the only way that you be in your daddy role is you got to play it. You've got to live your life according to those precepts. Otherwise, you're not doing your job. You are not being a daddy, you being a father. That's why when we pray, we say Abba, Father. Abba is a term that little Jewish kids use to refer to their parents. It, it literally translates to either Papa or Daddy. So when we say Abba Father, we're establishing that relationship. We're not saying you you just created us and left. You stayed and formed a relationship. So now when I say Abba, I'm saying Daddy. And what does that mean? That means I'm going to follow your precepts. And while I'm living that out, I'm going to show my kids. I'm going to show my wife. I'm going to live out loud. And guess what? It's a promise attached to that. At the bottom, it says, so that your days and the days of your sons 
may be multiplied. So guess what? If you don't do your job, you're not endangering just yourself. You're endangering generations behind you because you don't want to stand up and do your job. You don't want to be daddy. Next slide, please. So how else are we supposed to look at this? We all know this verse. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and they won't depart from it. So while you're doing that work, while you're following those precepts, and while you got your family chained to you, and we're walking through this, and they're watching me go through, that's training them up. Because it says in the way that they should go. Some people be like, well, how they go? I don't know what way they're supposed to be. Well, how do you get there? It's the way God intended. And guess what? Because we are all created uniquely, God has to give that to you so you give the right things to say to that child. Because if you depend on your own understanding, you could lead them all kinds of wrong. And now that child is not in the way that they should go. They're in the way that you are going. In Hebrews, he said, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? This is the part that people get caught up in and sometimes they don't like because this is not the fun part, but it is the truth. If you love somebody, you tell them the truth. And sometimes that includes discipline. That includes correction. You are off course, I gotta get you back in line. We've got a lot of toddlers here. And there's a busy street right over there. If, and, I, and I'm not picking on JoJo, I love JoJo. But you gotta, you gotta call a spade a spade, right? If JoJo takes off into the middle of the street, I don't think Joel will say, now, Jojo, you need to get out of that street, son. Those, those cars are really dangerous and, and you could get hurt. Right? If, if we do that, it is one, ineffective, and two, it shows something wrong here because I should, my love should cause me to be like, uh-uh. I don't want you to hurt yourself. So guess what? Sometimes I got to hurt you. Sometimes I've got to give you correction because what is beyond me is much worse. If I don't let you, if I let you run into that street and I don't put a fear that, hey, I may not understand because Jojo is not running around thinking about the consequences. He's not doing the science in his head of the force of this moving object is going to take me out in the form of a car. He's not processing that. All Jojo sees is I see fun in the street and I'm about to go out and do it. But it is our job as daddies to step in and say no. No, you may not even understand why I'm doing this. I'm going to spank you so that you are deterred from going there. So when you think about hurting yourself, you like, mm, my behind has reminded me that that is not the move. God does us the same way. And we're supposed to be in that relationship. When you're not doing right, correction is coming. If it don't come, you ought to be scared. He clearly states who he loves, he chastens. That means he puts you back in line. So to you, to Jojo, Jojo is like you a player, hater. You are hating on my fun. That's his perception. But as a father, as a daddy, you've got to let him understand. You can get upset, but guess what? I love you and you're going to be preserved. So it may not feel 
right? He may even look at you and you may even be thinking, ooh, how, how, how can somebody, how can this be love? How can me inflicting pain be love? But guess what? The, 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 the alternative is horrible. So you don't want to go there. So just as God is instructing us, we've got to instruct our children. And it's not, all right, I'm going to say this. It's not up to your wife. It's not up to their mother. It is on you. That is your position. So you can't, don't, don't walk around and say, well, them kids is bad if they mama would. Oh, well, they would, they would act better if I, if, if they were with me or if, if I, di no, that's on you. That is on you. So you've got to make sure you take your role. But here's the other side of it. This is why it's, it's not easy being a father. Because while you're doing that, it says fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, does that mean you should go through life and never make your children mad? No. No. They're going to get angry when discipline comes in. That is nature. We are not rejoicing, uh, even though God tells us to, right? Most of us are rejoicing when we're going through. When you broke and you hungry, you usually your first thing getting to be like, thank you, Jesus, for this poverty. <laughs> but you have got to understand that that discipline, all of that is leading you. It's teaching you. Right. And so as you're doing this, your children will get upset. But here's the thing. Your job is to make sure that their instruction is following the Lord. My father, regardless of what you did on Saturday, right? And this is when I was grown too. Regardless of how late you came home on Saturday, on Sunday morning, you getting dressed, you put no call, and we, we gonna be in church. Now, whatever your issue is, I, that's your issue. But what we are going to do while you're in my house is follow these instructions. And if your instructions, if your agenda don't match up, we gonna, there's going to be some reckoning. Right? And so at the same time, you don't look to antagonize your children. You don't look to go after them and get them upset. You don't provoke. Provoke means to poke at. So you don't take your authority and abuse it in a manner that is hurtful to your child. Don't make your child upset where they don't feel love from you. You can discipline in love and that won't engender anger. As a matter of fact, when I used to make my dad upset, I got hurt. I was hurting on the inside because I was like, man, I disappointed him. Look at all that he does for us, and I disappointed him. So make sure you have, you have permission to follow those instructions. Just don't abuse the position in which you are in. Don't lead your child to destruction. Next slide. I know I'm getting there. As I said, Father knows best. Now, these particular verses are particularly meaningful to me because of the man that is pictured. One of his favorite things to say <laughs> was Proverbs 22 and 15. Foolishness. Is bound up in the heart of a child. But what do we need to fix it? The rod of discipline. He used to say the rod of correction. But that was him referring to the discipline that he's showing in himself. He had, he, he had to let us know, I'm not 
son, you're not getting disciplined because I don't like you. You're not getting disciplined because I have some issue against you. What I am doing is making sure that you follow these instructions. So I am disciplining you because that's what the instructions say. I don't want to lose you. So if I don't want to lose you, guess what? I got to get that rod of correction. I got to make sure you get away from that. Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. Some of y'all, some of y'all said that's, that's the sermon right there. <laughs> Gerald Snipes was a, a master at making sure that we received the rod, but we didn't. We didn't die. As a matter of fact, we flourished. We went the opposite way. And it's directly due to the fact that he was unafraid to take his role and provide correction. It's not, it's not popular anymore, right? I, I remember being young and, and uh, my, my friends, my, my other friends who were in different neighborhoods used to get grounded. I never, I had never heard of that. And uh, my, my good friend David, he got in trouble and, and I was like, oh man, you about to get a spanking. And he looked at me, he said, what? No. I said, well, well what's gonna happen? He said, well, I'm gonna get grounded. And I was like, what is that? And he said, well, I'm gonna be on punishment and I can't do certain things for an amount of time. I said, what? That exists? Can your father go and talk to my father? Because he did not see that in the handbook. And, and it became a real thing to where I really understood when my father said to me, listen, he who withholds his rod hates. Hates. So we go back to you don't want to get him angry. Don't you hate them? Provide discipline. But he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Everybody say diligently. I like words. That means I'm not stopping. There's no days off. It ain't no, oh, all right, you, you get to make it today. No. As a father, if we want to have a successful daddyship, we have got to be diligent in our discipline. And that does not just apply to our children. That also applies to ourselves. Because they're only going to do what you do. And that's your role. So if they acting up, all right. if your kids are known as bad, guess who that falls on? If your kids are out of control, ill-mannered, any other negative you want to put at that we use to describe children, guess who that falls on? So we've got to recognize, like my father did, every day he lived it out. There were no days off. We got up, morning prayer. Every Wednesday, we was going to be in midweek service. Every Sunday morning, we were going to be at church. Every day, you were going to pray. You were going to interact with the word daily. You were going to memorize verses. Why? Because he's writing it up on your heart as well as his own. And he pushed us. I, I remember morning prayer, we, we had one verse one day, and I was like, good. Then we had two verses the next day at prayer. Then by the end of the week, we got a whole Bible recitation just going through prayer. But the end goal was he understood I've got to be diligent in this thing. If I don't, my family is gone and it falls on me directly. I can't look and say, well, you didn't and they didn't. It is on you as the father, as the daddy. You got to stay in discipline. Last slide, please. 
What happens when we don't do our job? These, this is not from a Christian website. This is secular created from the National Fatherhood Initiative. The father, uh, the father absence crisis in America. One in every four children in America has a non-resident father. One in four. So why is this role so important? If you look at, look at the effects, what happens when we don't do our job? when we don't form that relationship. Four times greater risk of going into poverty. More likely to have behavioral problems. More likely to go to prison and commit crime. More likely to become pregnant as a teen. More likely to face abuse and neglect more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs, more likely to drop out of school. 80% of America's dropouts, fatherless homes. So if we don't do our job, all of the ills that we're seeing in the world, all of these things that we attribute to, oh, our educational system is failing, Oh, our financial system is failing. Oh, our criminal justice system is failing. How do we fix it? You are looking at the solution. If we do our jobs as fathers, look at everything that gets affected. Look at all of the change that depends on you being a diligent disciplinarian being a diligent Christian and following the instructions that God has left for us. So let me say to all of the fathers, happy Father's Day, but more importantly, happy Daddy's Day. Let's go and let's build, amen?